Okay, guys, I think we're going to go ahead and start speaking. This is Kevin at NetX. I head up the product development and business development here. And I have, obviously, on the line is Claire Blackman, the digital asset manager at Peabody Essex. Hi, everybody. Um, probably a lot of you know Claire. Um, we were, were discussing sort of all the work she had done in getting this this thing off the ground. And um, it seemed like a topic that would be of interest, um, and I guess it, it is. Um, so we're gonna walk through a lot of the stuff that Claire did um, in getting this going. And she actually just recently held her launch party last week. So it's, it's very good timing. Um, a little intro to Peabody Essex Museum. It actually you know, is uh, the oldest continuously operating museum in the US. Um, just outside of Boston in Salem, Mass. Um, now counted among the top 20 American art museums, um, et cetera. So I thought we'd do a little intro in case you weren't familiar with, with Peabody Essex. Um, it's an awesome place. I've been there. Encourage you all to go. We're in um, an art and culture museum. Art and culture, right. <laughs> So we have a few photos, you know, we're all visual people. Um, Claire started out with 10 terabytes roughly in, in photography and some video that was coming in. And, and these are some of the assets um, that we, I thought I'd just show a few of these. Um, I don't know, Claire, did you want to comment on any of these or just sort of? Oh no, I tried to pick things that kind of sort of related to the concept of dams or organizing. And, um, yeah, they're nice. I got nice yeah. stuff. Nice things. So these are, these are the areas we're going to look at. Um, when you're looking at, you know, a big collection of photography like that, how do you start um, and where do you go from there? So I'll just be sort of running through these and Claire will talk in detail on, on these topics. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to talk a little bit about my position here. Uh, I was hired in 2013. I'm the first digital asset manager that Penn has ever had. I was hired in the publications department because my boss, the head of publications, had her own design studio before she came here. And so she knew the utility of having a digital asset manager in a way that I think other maybe museums don't. So she would worked for two years to get the position approved. She did. She hired me. And it's interesting to point out that we had a digital asset manager before we had a digital asset management system. And I think that, that is a good way to go about it um, because that way you have somebody to shepherd the process and to do all the research and do all these fun buy-in things rather than just, oh, we have a thing, now we need somebody to run it. That's kind of a little bit backwards, I think. Yeah, so, that's an excellent point. You had a, you had a orientation set up for you from the get-go. Um, yeah, it was kind of my mandate here to put in place good processes so that there wouldn't be so much confusion. I come from a copyright background, so I wanted to make sure that everyone was using images properly, getting the proper permission for them. Um, the curators, the assistant curators, the photographers, they were all very, there's a lot of anxiety around the process, and so it was my job to put it all together, and it came very obvious very quickly that what we needed was a dams. So I set off to look for a good one. Yeah, I think that's not always the case. So you were set off on good feet, on good footing to go do some research. Yeah. Um, so okay, sorry we skipped over that part, but you, okay. now let's talk about the conferences you you started. Really, obviously, did some web research and looking around, then you determined there were some conferences you could go to to dig deeper. Yeah, I mean there are a million Sam's products, and so you have to narrow it down somehow. And I think what was helpful is I went. Ed Rodley told me to go to Museum Computer Network Conference. Like the first month I was here, he's like, oh, you're gonna go to the Museum Computer Network Conference, right? And I was like, well, what's that? And so I went, people were talking about the dams there. Uh, uh, various vendors were there as well. And so that was really my first introduction to what a dams is and how it works and what it's good for in a museum. I did those, I do those every year, MCN. And then uh, a couple of years ago, I also decided to go to the Henry Stewart Dam conference, which they have in various cities. I went to the one in New York because it's easy for me to go on the train to New York. And it was a really interesting, different experience because I've been to all of these 
museum conferences, but never like a commercial sector conference. And so the way I was interested to see how they were all thinking about dams, what they were doing in the commercial sector. And I got some really interesting perspective there, I think. The Bake Off idea came from there. We'll talk about that later. Um, different kinds of vendors helped me really hone sort of what I wanted versus me because a lot of these vendors at the Henry Stewart conference, they were much more focused on like marketing advertising firms and they didn't, their product didn't really do what I wanted it to for my particular needs of just, I have lots of images and I want everyone to be able to see them, but not everyone to be able to download them. And they were very much more about version control and InDesign compatibility and I didn't know about those things. Right, okay. So MCN and Henry Stewart, you come out of those with a lot more familiarity on what you want um, and who's, who's doing the things you're looking for. Um, I thought this was interesting. You did a, a fairly comprehensive peer survey, which, which yeah, I think is great. Yeah. We, have this, we had this list of museums that the powers that be here feel are our peer museums. So what I did was, and maybe some of you were the people I called about this, I went around and I said, hey guys, what do you use, do you have a dams and what do you use for it? And then, you know, do you like it, of course. And I just wrote those down. I was like, okay, ev literally every other, I think there was one place that didn't have one and another place that was gonna get one within a year or two. But everyone else had a dams. A lot of them were thinking about a sec second generation dams. So that helps make the case um, that, you know, this is not some special crazy thing. This is a thing that is industry standard to do. <laughs> right. Yeah, because we want to get to the concept of how you got engagement, and that's a part of it. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, you did an assessment um, based on storage volume and kind of your user base um, as you started to know what these software packages did. Um, I think we can go right through that one, because I think you got to the idea where you wanted to do a brown bag presentation. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I love this idea. Um, these are okay. These okay. are some points on from your from your overview of these, like how to do a brown bag presentation on this. Do you want to go ahead and can walk through these? Up, can you put them all up so I can see what they are, and then I'll just talk about the brown bag. Yeah. Yeah. So we were doing these the social media snack group, social media something committee. They were holding these brown bags pretty on the regular. It was like. Instagram, what is it, how to do it, everyone come eat pizza and uh, learn about it. So they were holding those and I thought this would be a good uh, topic for one of them. So after I came back from Henry Stewart, I made a brown bag presentation. I had pizza, everyone came. I had like a bunch of people, the room was full, maybe 50. And then I gave a little presentation. I was like, hey, I just got back from this conference. What is a dams and how can it help PEM? Uh, the wife of the director came to that. She's a guide, so she was very into the concept. I think it was good to have her being very excited about it. So I showed some screenshots. I talked about some philosophy of this sort of thing. Uh, some good takeaways, I guess, especially from Henry Stewart. The guy from Craft was talking about how digital assets are the essence of our stories. And that's a very, like storytelling is a very hot topic. At PEM right now, it's the, it's the buzzword to do storytelling. So I was, I was into that quote, that was good. Um, I pointed out that, you know, a uh, good dam is part of a system, it's a set of processes, it's people driven, it's not just like a piece of software that you buy and then it fixes all your problems. Everyone knows that's not, software doesn't just fix it. Um, metadata is very important. A dam is only as good as, you know, as much stuff as you can find in it. If you can search, then it's good. If you have the data about what this thing is, then that's good. So metadata is a love note to the future is the romantic way of putting that. And then finally, the concept that digital assets are called assets for a reason because they have value. And I think that it's easy to be like, oh, the collection has value, it's valuable, the buildings are assets, they have value. But like the, the work product that we make in the photography lab or that we hire someone to do or that we, you know, make books and we make all this cool programs and stuff. Those are all, you know, these are digital assets, things that we need to leverage as well. And leverage is a very business kind of word, but I think that it's a concept people can understand that there's value to this giant mass of 
digital assets that we have together. Yeah. So I, I think it's great. I gave the presentation and I had a lot of gifts and people ate pizza and they liked it. Right. So you had 50 people attending one of these. I mean, that's a lot to do this pre-engagement. Let people know this is coming. It's of high value and um, we want your input. I, I love it. And I invited everyone to like, not just, oh, I think these people will use the dams or these won't because, and now that I've implemented my dams, you know, everybody can have access to it because I don't know what they're going to do with it. It's just, it's a resource. Right. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Um, then you did a listening tour. Um, why don't we walk through this? So you, this is actually an internal facing sort of project. Why don't you talk about how you how you went about that? Yeah, put up all the, the bullet points for me. Okay. So, um, so I did a listening tour. I have a lot of friends who are software designers or graphic designers, and I guess I kind of got this idea that you know you want to survey your users, like how are people actually going to use this? Because you know you have one idea how people are going to use it, but I learned a lot of interesting different things that people actually wanted to do when I was out that I hadn't thought of. So I went to the head of each department, and again, not just the like creative services, although I definitely went to them, the photography department, but also, you know, development and exhibition planning and the designers. And I said, you know, I sat them all down. And I said, okay, what you don't want to do is ask, how do you guys want to use a dams? Because first of all, they don't know what a dams is. And second of all, people don't really know, even when you're trying to develop software, people don't really know what they actually want. So it's a more broad and broad question. How do you use images or videos in your work? How would you like to use or interact with them? Like, what would you like to be able to do? And I got some interesting replies that like some I was, you know, clearly people want to be able to download pictures without having to email me and bother me about it. Or they want the social media manager wants to get good captions for things that she can download and know what's good to put online. But also guest services, they were like, what we need the most more than anything is to be able to tell if an object is on view and if so, what gallery it's in, which um, they can't they can't do in our collection management system because they don't have access to that. So people will come to them and be like, oh, I want to see that painting. Where is it? Is it up? And they're like, oh, unless they happen to like remember, but they're not going to remember every single thing that's in the museum. So we took that into account when we were doing our our setup. Um, what else? Oh, the guides. We had the guides send me back their feedback too, and what they want is to be able to show a picture from the collection on their iPad when they're giving a tour in the gallery. So yeah, I think listening tour is like super crucial to do. Some of this other stuff is just you know fun or it can help with buy-in, but listening tour is like if you want to get your setup correct, then you need to make this useful to people. And in order to do that, you need to listen to what they actually want to do. And everyone feels really like involved in it at that point. Maybe they have a stake in, you know, Claire came by and actually cares what we're going to do. And I'm just gonna be like, oh, you have to use this now. This is how this is. Right. It's not about the software. It's about the engagement and a lot of this diplomacy at the beginning. I mean, cause this informs your taxonomy in the end real use cases, workflows, all kinds of stuff as you're looking at products. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the development people too, they told me that they wanted to make sure that certain certain donors weren't in pictures that people could use because it could cause problems with other donors. And I was like, wow, that is a level at which I had not thought at all about, but mm -hmm. definitely don't want to get involved in. So, so they'll right. have things over their development photo, uh, photos. That kind of thing. Yeah. You won't learn right. unless you actually go and ask them. Right. Yeah, I think that's really important. Okay, cool. Um, then you started, now that you've got some real input from the entire organization, by the way, we should mention that you did this organization-wide. I think you did say that, but you've got, um, I believe there's 250 or close to 300 employees or something, so there's a lot of people that you're out touching. Then you sort of are informed on what you need this thing to do. You know a lot more about what this organization needs. So you started product demos. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this is what we had for yeah. this. So for me, we did I did in person some in person demos at the conferences. I did some online demos. 
um, for me, it's really good to be able to sit down and just like poke at it and touch it and be like, oh, can I figure out how this works without like super complicated instructions? I think that's important. Um, so I had fun doing that. And then once I had these more specific ideas about, oh, I needed to have a permission system that does this or that, or I needed to be able to download at different sizes, then I uh, went to a couple of vendors and I said, you know, can it do this thing? Can we have a call where you show me that functionality? And so Nate, yeah. whoever uh, would show me and they'd be like, oh, it goes, you know, it does this and there's what you can and can't do. And that was nice to do as well. Yeah. I think it's really specifying the functionality that your environment needs, your people, not just your brain, but you now are coming at this with a, a bigger perspective. I think that's important. Mm -hmm. uh, that helps you build the short list. Um, okay, so you get to the point of, we are gonna write a budget proposal. I know a lot about what this organization is looking for. Um, and now I need to kind of go up the tree a little bit um, and, build the case for executive buy-in in this yeah. document, right? Yeah. yeah. So the way this worked was uh, in the fall of 2016, I was in a meeting about an unrelated topic and uh, the deputy director told me at the end of it, it was the deputy director and the manager, the head of collection services. Uh, the deputy director just told me to write a proposal and put the dams in the fall budget. So I had like four weeks to do the whole thing. But I like to say that she wouldn't have just told me to put the dams in if it hadn't been a thing that she already knew about, that she'd been hearing about, that everyone at the museum was probably in her ear being like, oh, this would be so cool, which they mm -hmm. wouldn't hear about if, you know, if I hadn't gone talk to them, if I hadn't had the public brown bag thing. So by now, um, there's a certain level of executive buy-in and that they're thinking, oh, this is okay. This is okay to consider. And we also had a new CFO who was very good at you know we are spending money in order to achieve things and so she's not just like no spending of money um so what i did was by then i had i had a short list of a few like a very short list of a few vendors that i was into and i i wrote this budget proposal the first draft was like four times as long as it ended up being and it showed it to my boss and she was like no you need to cut that down I like I originally included the list of all the other museums and their dams and she's like no just cut that out <laughs> it'll be okay and it turned into a real kind of executive summary I made points about um, what a dance could do for us I mean and again these are informed by the, the listening tour and what I'd heard other departments saying about it and then an important concept there was that DAMS is an essential tool for helping us meet our institutional goals. So like, you know, just when you're doing your, your talent planning or your, your HR yearly review, as we are doing this week, so it's on my mind, you do want to be like, okay, I have helped our institution meet its goals or I've met the goals in this way. And that'll be very direct for them to be like, oh, okay, I can see why we would spend money on uh, dams because it helps us do X, Y, Z other thing that is what we are really aiming toward. Uh, right. So for the proposal, I also had, I had the money in there, so I had to come up with, you know, how much is this gonna cost? And by that time, I didn't do a very formal RFP situation, but it was a bullet list of like, okay, please quote me for 10 terabytes of storage and it's going to be cloud storage and then talk to IT and we have a very small IT department so they were like yeah let's host it in the clouds we don't have to do it another outreach thing I guess and so 10 terabytes cloud it has to have these kinds of permissions this kind of thing in it and then the the shortlist people quoted me how much it would cost with estimates for all of the developing and whatnot of the, you know, it has to link, has to link to our collections management database, which doesn't have an API, which is not great, but it, you know, it's extra things to consider when in the budget. So you don't want to have surprises in the budget. Uh, one thing I would have put is I would have put some money in that budget. If I'm doing this again, I would put money in that budget for more of this party time situation. Like I would buy, you know, some more pizza or some more computers to help people do the trainings and stuff. So that's something to consider when you're doing a budget proposal, like put a lot of money in there for the outreach. Yeah. 
maybe some printers. Yeah. I mean, my, yeah. my department budget is covering a certain amount of it, but it, I could really have gone all out if I thought of that in the beginning. I think that's a good point. Um, budgeting for outreach and engagement and diplomacy, but also if you have an existing dam for change management, you know, we're, we're you were coming from a place of, of kind of marketing the concept. Um, if you have one, why are we changing? You know, it's the same thing. You kind of need to make the argument in the in the the story. So yeah, that's great. I think. Yeah. Okay. Um, the Bake Off. Yes. Bake yeah. Off. Discuss. So Claire actually <laughs> used this GIF, by the way, when uh, the vendors of one was me were on premise um, trying to understand this. This was awesome. Yeah. So we want to tell you you got this idea and how you kind of went about it. It wasn't this GIF. It was another GIF of Nadia, like, pounding on some puff pastry, but I couldn't find it again. So anyway, great British Bake Off, great show. Uh, on it. So yeah, no, this I got this idea at the Henry Stewart conference. They were all talking about it. There was a session where they actually held a bake off. So the concept is that they you have a few vendors. They had three vendors. I did two for like your final, final, final choices. And you bring them in and they do a product demo, like an in-person product demo like you would normally. So all of my I invited again, it was public to anybody who wanted to come. We got the big presentation room. And so they they can do their regular product demo, and that's cool. But then afterwards, there is a surprise list of tasks that you give to them. And they both do the same. They shouldn't be in the room at the same time, for sure. But the deal is that they, I gave them a list. It was like, here's a thumb drive with 10 pictures of my cat on it. You need to um, upload them to the dams. You need to tag them all with her name, which is Fuzz Bucket. You need to then send your favorite one to a friend, like either by email or by link. And then there were a couple of other like PDF finding tasks. But I think that the concept of the Bake Off is that you want to hit them head to head to see, you know, in a situation where they don't they don't get to plan, here's what I'm going to show them. You know, how well does it actually work with some basic tasks that I think people are going to do pretty often when it comes to dams. They're going to upload stuff. They're going to find search for stuff. They're going to send stuff to people outside the museum. So that was cool for them to see. They could, you know, see each vendor's product. It's good for them to see it on the screen rather than just talking about screenshots and stuff. And they could see how well it worked. So right. I, I'm interested, Kevin, like, what did you think about that? <laughs> that was pretty entertaining, of course. The, yeah, we were sort of used to doing this a little bit. But, of course, there was about, I don't know, 75 people in the room. There's an instant sort of surprise. Here's a thumb drive. And here's a list of tasks to do. Um, I think it's I think it's a great thing because those tasks, we're totally informed by your user interviews and what your what your teams wanted to see done. So I think it's a really tailored, specific way to get, you know, concrete proof of whether or not this particular software package does the stuff this organization wants. It is obviously a little bit more challenging for the vendor to, you know, sort of, you know, on the fly, you know, execute these things. But um, yeah, it was it was fun actually. You put a little stress on stress test the situation a bit. I think that helps. And then people people can see, oh, this is actually easy to do, even when you're, you know, stressed out in front of a crowd, maybe. <laughs> At the Bake Off, I also had um, I had handouts for everybody, and it just was a quick, you know, pro con, NetX this, fiction this, you know, which ones did you like, which ones didn't you, why, which one would you pick? I put at the end. Uh, you know, if you had to choose one, which one would you choose? And I think that gives people like something to focus on. They're not so they're not just on their phones. It makes them think. You know, what do I want to say to this? Let me think about what is it I like about this dance. And I mean, some of them wrote like, "It's so pretty," or "It looks like Google Images," or "I want a T-shirt with that logo on it." And I was like, "Okay, sure." <laughs> I guess you're at least thinking about it. So then at the end, I get to I get to hear their feed. I get to collect their feedback, and I had my intern type it up and that sort of thing. So I have all that feedback too. Right. 
I think that's a great thing to do. Uh, not that I'm telling people to do Bake Off, but you can. But um, getting that feedback in detail is is really useful and powerful. That's what you want to do for sure. I do. I used to. I, I taught writing classes in graduate school, and I think it's very important to get people to write down their thoughts. And be like, oh, what do you think about this? And maybe they'll say something. But if you make them write it down, you'll get better quality of thought. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Um, and then as you okay, so you go through the process, budget's approved, product is is purchased, you're starting the implementation, um, and that's you know. By the way, we didn't really mention Claire is a team of one, so all of this process was done you know kind of by her. But then this idea was was to get an earlier doctor group going once you've sort of gotten the the environment stood up. Um, so let's just show these guys. So oh, let's start with this. You did an open announcement to anyone that was interested to be in this group, right? Yeah, we have a monthly like internal staff newsletter that I just had its year anniversary this month. And so it's called the Museum of Messenger. And so I put a little announcement in the Museum of Messenger. And I don't know how many people read it, but I, I got some uh, interest from that. That, you know the dams is launching and i'm excited about this if you want to be in an early adopter group email me and a few people did so i had about 10 in the end i did a i did some direct soliciting too i asked my department people i was like hey guys in my department which is exhibitions research and publications so i have a bunch of assistant curators as well so if you guys want to be in the early adopter group uh one of the curators asked me about it. he's like oh when is the dams launching and like oh soon do you want to be an early adopter and he said no <laughs> but but he was so excited about it. Um, so I had like social media manager involved, a couple of marketers, uh, someone from creative services. I specifically went to creative services and said, hey guys, I know you're going to be heavy users of this dam, so can you please send somebody to be one? And I should say the early adopter group is separate from the core team, who are the people that helped me do the implementation. Uh, the core team we put together was me and the head of IT, uh, the manager of the collections database, so she's in registration, the head of the photo services department, and then also a librarian, because we have a pretty substantial research library attached to the museum that has a lot of their own assets. So the five of us were the core team, but the early adopter group were um, a set of people who are just going to be regular, run-in-the-mill users. And what I did with them is they got trained early, they like a couple weeks before I launched and then I gave them homework. I said, hey, you know, when you're so now that you know how to do this, please put together a collection. We made two collections, one dogs and one cats. Um, the data coming out of our collections management system isn't particularly robust in certain areas. Let's put that uh, diplomatically. So I think people will want to be able to search cat and get all the cats that are in the collection or get to search dog and get all the dogs that are in the collection. So we started making sets of these. If people knew about dogs, they would put them all. It's a group effort in there and I would tag them. And so now people, so it's just data entry that they got to participate in and everyone's like, ooh, you came up with some good ones. So we had, we had the training, we had the homework, and then I had a follow-up session. I was like, okay, um, again, for the homework, I had them write down just really short couple of sentences of each. What do you like about the dams? What do you imagine, name two things you imagine you'll do in the dams to help your job? And then what are your suggestions for making the dams better? Because they're always, you know, there's always something that they want instead. And so I think mm -hmm. uh, the, the girl from Creative Services had the most explicit things that she wanted. She wanted a attribute that would say, if the image was edited or not because there are we take a lot of photos we have a photo department of it now down to two people and she wanted to know like is this just ready to go as it is or do i need to give them more time to edit it so that's something that we will incorporate when we're you know as we uh keep working on this and again it's important to while, while you're doing all of this process and buy-in is to say, hey, 
listen, a dams is an ongoing process. It's never done. You don't just like upload some stuff and be like, that's cool, have a dams. You have to keep working on it. You have to keep working on the process, changing it, making it better. And I think people understand that it's not just a one and done, ship it and be done kind of situation anymore. Right. I think that's a, an old school way of looking at it. And I think um, that's an important thing to get people to, to look at. And then you do have them kind of as an ongoing role as ambassadors. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So when we start, when we start training in more in earnest in a week or two, I want the people that were the early adopters to sort of be my TAs and go around and help people that need it. I, I told everyone in the early adopter group meeting, go back and be evangelists and tell people how great it is and get them excited to use it. So they are helping me that way and they, they get to be, you know, they get to be special and see it first and do it first. And right. then, in, in exchange, you know, they can help a little bit. And also, I think it'll take some of the tech support off of me. I'm hoping if we have, mm -hmm. uh, if I maybe keep meeting with them and say, okay, guys, what what's your department wanting about this? And, what are some basic tasks that people will need help to do? And they can, you know, hopefully, hopefully they'll go to Julie and be like, Julie, how do I do this? And she'll be able to tell them rather than they call me up. So I don't, I don't really want to be tech support full time for this thing, hopefully. There you go. You're on offense instead of defense. If you do your regularly quarterly meetings with, with those folks, you could probably mm -hmm. get that. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm going to make some gifts too. I haven't quite got around to it, but I'm going to be like, you know, people don't read documentation so mm -hmm. it'll just be like how do, I, how do I download an image oh look at the gif it'll show you so I'm, I'm happy yeah. to get a bunch of those mm -hmm. yeah that's an interesting point building your own we, we have a lot of folks do this that go to varying levels of depth but to build your own specific help materials you know with your instance of NetX so it's showing your actual images and, and your folder structure and all that yeah um, yeah Okay, cool. Um, and then launch party. I love that you actually decided to do this. Um, why don't we talk a little bit about it? Sure. It was this. This one was not my idea. It was the idea of the department secretary, or sorry, the administrative assistant. She has been. She's the same one that does the internal newsletter, and she was looking for new ways to get people to, you know, come out and celebrate things together. So we did one for the opening of the playtime show month before, and then for this month. She was like, why don't we have it be at the dam's launch party? And I was like, oh, that's a great idea. So again, we invited everybody. We brought them pizza. I cannot emphasize how far pizza goes towards making people <laughs> get to things. And pizza and cupcakes. And I, again, in the big presentation space, I gave like a five minute intro where I just showed, hey, here's some cool stuff we have. And here's the dams. And here's what's cool about it. And then I had free workstations and an iPad set up at the front of the room and people could just sit and eat pizza if they wanted you know, or they could come up and uh, scroll through the images and look at look at the cool stuff and try to find things that they knew existed. And then I also bought a little photo printer. It was cute, a couple hundred bucks and it'll print four by six like super quality glossy photos which fewer people took advantage of than I expected but I said hey if you find it find an image you like in the dams, I will print it for you and you can put it on your desk. So that was kind of a, a takeaway. I wanted them to have some physical takeaway with them to be like, oh, this is this is the thing that it can do. This is the thing that right. I've got. Yeah. Uh, right, I love that, a little functional thing. Um, okay, excellent. Um, we're gonna start I think that concludes everything. Uh, Claire, any other final thoughts? We're going to open it up to Q&A if any of you folks have questions. You can oh, enter them yeah. in the little webinar thing. Yeah, okay. I guess, uh, just shout out to the people from the Bodleian that I saw. They have Bodleian people here because I studied abroad and have very fond memories. Oh, right. That's all I got. <laughs> right, okay, that concludes our prepared statements. Um, Anyone have any thoughts, questions, ideas, concerns? Oh, the Bodleian says, hello, that's Andrew from the Bodleian. Hey. <laughs> I was at New College in 2005. 
right. Okay, so here's a question. Um, this is from Travis. Um, how long did it take to get funding for the project, and did it require a grant? It did not require a grant, although we did apply for one that we did not get. Um, it since I got here, it was a few years, like two or three years, I want to say. But also, I talked about how we got a new CFO, and she was very on board. So I think it was a pretty, it was pretty fast after she came on board, and kind of the the floodgates opened of, oh yeah, we do actually have to spend money because spending money is a legitimate thing to do. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, as, yeah, I wrote that budget proposal in the fall and I had money in the spring and I bought it in June. So it went pretty quickly once everyone had already decided. Right. You had some institutional buy-in in a way yeah. in that you were hired to shepherd a project like this. Um, and I would say from my perspective, um, that's generally, you know, depends on your organization. It's really relative, but you can, you can look at three to nine months if, if the organization isn't aware of a, of a need for this, if you're pushing it and you're the evangelist, um, obviously it's relative to your group. Um, it, hopefully that answers that, Travis. We got a few more questions we'll get to, but ask a follow-up if you want. Um, this is from Christina Gibbs. What does your help guide look like? Are you using any specific software for that or other tools? My help guide, uh, currently my help guide is the PDF that NetX provided. It will be some GIFs. It will be a intranet site where all the links will be, you know, how do you get to the dams? How do you log into the dams? What is the dams for? And where are the, where are the links for the, the uploading and the downloading and the new photography requests? That's, Kind of, I mean, I should do more of that, and I probably just didn't have time to develop it. We rolled out, I bought it in June, and we're rolling out now, so it was nine months, just me. So, you know, if I had more people on this, if I had, if I didn't have a bajillion other books to do and whatnot, I would have written a better um, help guide, but for now, I don't have very much. I'm going to hopefully give people the basics, and that will be enough for now, and then we'll write more I do want to write documentation once we figure out how we want the processes to be, for example, for you know requests to do things and approvals and whatnot. Right, and so you know we provide kind of a general overview doc, but FYI, um, it is uh, often an intranet page that's simply how you do that. Yeah, yeah. And I want it to be easy stuff to remember. So be like, oh, how do I get to that? You know, m.org slash dams or something like that. Because right. also I don't want to I don't want to be spelling out URLs for people. Okay. And there right. is a difference between between general how do I what do I click to do and also and then the managerial kind of the people that are doing the uploading being like what do or don't I upload and what metadata do I put on it? What attributes? So it's kind of two separate issues. Right. Okay. Uh, the next one, this is from Christy Von Moos. What would you suggest if you are past the pilot stage but still need to get larger institutional buy-in? Oh, yeah. Well, if you're past the pilot, I guess the question is where, where then are you? Because if you have something to show people, you'd be like, oh, look, here are, here's the um, system. Here's some cool things that are in it. Like scroll and just scroll and scroll and scroll through all these awesome pictures and people like that sort of thing. Um, I did a, uh, when I had the first thing set up, I actually, I didn't mention this, but I had a, another just private meeting with the chief curator and who is the deputy director, the one that told me to put the request in the budget and also the the collections manager and I just showed them I was like I did this here's how it is it looks like this it does good things and they seem to be into that so I think the more face time you can get the more you can open it up and be like hey guys I'm just going to show you this thing I'm going to give you some pizza that's yeah how to do it and I love the idea too of, of the listening tour concept maybe your past pilot stage possibly re-engage certain department heads or teams to get additional feedback that you're going to feed 
into your, you know, executive level, you know, conversation. Say, I, I'm aware of all this stuff that's going on, these specific requirements and interests and, you know, desires from these teams that could be helpful. Yeah, that's a good one to like, you know, I'm, I'm building this. It could go this way or that way. Which way do you guys want? Yeah, we know there's, we're aware of these, these needs are out there. This will address them if you can get some of those specifics. Okay, um, this is from um, Karina. Can you state again who was on your internal dams team, meaning uh, yeah, the, the core team? team. Yeah. yeah. So it's me, the digital asset manager, the head of photography, the IT manager, the registrar who manages the collections database, because that was crucial because we needed it to talk to the dams and all the information about it, pictures of collections objects is brought one way from the from the CMS from Museum Plus and then uh, the library one of the librarians so there's five of us okay um, and please ask follow-up questions if these aren't getting 100% clarified for you guys I think we're hitting them all but you can certainly type in again um, this one is uh, from Peter Hustis from NGA. It's very specific. Hi, just curious, just curious what you may have learned from our experiences when you interviewed us at the National Gallery. Oh yeah, I remember. I remember Peter Drucker told me that you guys wanted to go slower, and that NetX was um, not into that. But I was like, oh. That sounds like what I want. I want to go fast and implement this really quickly. So I have, um, I have sympathy for you probably having to deal with way more bureaucracy than I do over here. Uh, I do think I was very lucky to have a lot of autonomy here. Like my boss did not care what I was doing as long as I was, you know, doing her book projects, and the chief curator did not care what I was doing so long as you know I was getting it done. And I think that what I learned from you guys was that you, you know, you have a lot more hurdles to go through and you have a lot more process to do to make sure it serves a, a wide number of people. You guys are doing your second dams too. So I think that the deal is that whatever I did here, whatever I implemented, it would be better than nothing. And that was, that was kind of a relief. You know, you can, whatever I do, it's going to be fine. It's going to be okay. And so what I'm worried about, Oh, I've never done anything like this before. This is not really my training. I don't really know like project management. What am I doing? Am I forgetting things? Then I would be like, oh, well, whatever I do, it'll be fine. And also, if Trump can be president, I can do this too. <laughs> uh, right. So, okay, it's not like one big takeaway was you, you can do this process relative to your organization. Um, it's not a cookie cutter thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like I don't have All to right. do everything and it doesn't have my career. if I don't do something then I can do it later it'll be good enough right okay um, this next one is from uh, Denise Bastian did you have a special line item in your budget for bringing in your shortlist vendors or did the vendors absorb those costs how much roughly how much was your budget of your budget was for planning so it's actually two questions I think you guys absorbed the travel, didn't you? I don't remember. Yeah. yeah, I don't remember paying that. So the vendors traveled to me. And I mean, the costs for like pizza and stuff is not too bad. I didn't have a line item for that kind of thing. Um, right. The, the, I think the, that's, a, that's worth, that's a good, you mentioned in the end that you might, if you're doing it again, you, you would put that in, right? I would. And also the conferences, the conferences were on my professional development travel. I have very generous professional development budget here, so that was good. But I would recommend putting it. Right. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. And, you know, a lot of times it's under the, the term change management is, you know, in some organizations they use that to cover the, these concepts. Um, because it's recognized as being a necessary thing. That's true. Um, okay, this is another one from Denise. How much time? How much time did you have to set up your workflows before bringing on your earlier adopters? Yeah, we did. We did a few months of workflow setting up stuff. Uh, NetX has a process with a bunch of 
set you know meetings where they teach us the concepts like permissions and users and then we go and the core team would work on who the user should be and what the groups should be what the folder structure should be so we did i want to say about seven months of that sort of thing the early adopters i brought on like only a week or two before the actual thing went live so it was mostly done Okay, so it was a number of months that you yeah. were, yeah. Um, and obviously, from from our perspective, doing a lot of implementations, that can be relative to the scale of your deployment. Um, mm -hmm. But I would I would certainly allow months, not weeks, for for that part of it. Um, yeah, I agree. It's good to you know what do you want the folder structure to be. And also, as you you got to kind of sit and think with it for a while. You're like, I would just look at the folder structure and be like, oh, you know, that doesn't actually make sense. Let's, what is this folder for? Or I think I changed the, the user group several times before I actually ended up doing it in production. So yeah, I would recommend like taking, taking your time on the front, on the back end there. Front end, back end, better before you launch. Yeah, I mean the back end is the workflow setup and the front end is the experience of it. So you you can also do a phase one, phase two with those, um, where you're not necessarily launching all of your global organizational workflows at at once. Um, seen that done too. Um, okay, and then we have hopefully Denise, we got those covered. If you have any other thoughts, please just enter another question. Um, this is from Leslie. Uh, would you be willing to talk about all of the vendors you looked at and why you decided to go with NetX? Oh. oh um, well, I looked at a lot of vendors that were not memorable or interesting in any way. And that's the thing I did want to tell everybody that you know there are so many vendors that you have to narrow it down somehow and don't worry about like, am I choosing the best one for the best reasons? Like it can it can be really like these are the ones I see and I like right now. So why would I wait? Why would I bust my hump trying to do super a lot of research? There are people in front of me right now that I know are good. People that I know other museums are using, so they know the museum business, which is good. Um, I looked at, I guess the third finalist that I put on the um, the, sheet, the what is it the the budget proposal. The third finalist was Extensus. And I just felt like their product was not robust enough. They didn't do enough stuff for what I wanted. Fiction and NetX were the two finalists. They both have really good representation at MCN. A lot of people had them and really liked them. Um, I saw people moving away from Media Bin. I talked to people who were not into Media Bin and they wanted something different. So that, you know, people's opinions affect what they say about it, affects what I thought about. And then in the end, I chose NetX. I thought that the, the interface was really clean and it looked good and it was going to be easy to use. I thought that I really liked the, I don't want this to turn into like a, a PSA for NetX, but it, I chose them for a reason. I thought it was going to be very easy for me to configure. I don't program anything. I have no programming background whatsoever. And yet I can set up all these things pretty easily without having to go to a developer and be like, oh, write some code for me. And that was really crucial because I see that in our, with our collection management system, anytime we want anything done, we got to call the guy in Denver and have him write me some code and pay him money and that's no good. Uh, and then, yeah, when we, remember I said I had the feedback sheets at the Bake Off and the vast, vast, vast majority of people chose they were like NetX is the one that I would choose if I were up to me. So it wasn't really a democracy per se, but it was a very clear like people wanted. They liked the look of NetX, they liked the function of NetX, so that's what we went with. Right. Okay. So it was Piction, Extensus, and NetX in case anybody didn't hear all the names. Um Yeah, and maybe then I looked at I looked at a couple of gosh like Orange iOS. They gave me a Stroop waffle at Henry Stewart, and so I was like, okay. And they're they're from Boston, so I was like, sure, why not? But they were one of those ones that was very into more marketing than museum work, so I didn't go with them. Okay. 
hopefully that, that answered that, Leslie. Um, if you have more questions, go ahead. Um, here's another question from Alan. Were you able to harvest information from your collections database to help populate your metadata? Um, did the museum work that out or did your vendor do that? A uh, little of both. As I mentioned to our, our collections databases on Museum Plus, they're a European company. They don't have, the version we have does not have an API. We bought it in 2013, right as I was coming on board, so I did not have a say in the buying of that. So we did, we do want to do a one-way pull of data from the collections management system into the collections folder on the dams. So what we did was we had them make a shadow database which pulls only the fields that we wanted in the dams. And so that was part of the, the, on, the onboarding was to meet with the registrar and the librarian and be like, okay, so which ones do we want to actually pull? And yeah, on view gallery is gonna be like what, where location for the on view gallery and obviously artists and life dates and et cetera and title and dimensions. So then we had to be like, okay, which ones do we want? What format do we want it to show in? And then we had to match each of those to an attribute that was gonna be in NetX so that it would know where to put all of this information. There was a certain amount of programming on, that we had to pay Museum Plus to do for that. I'm sure there'll be a certain amount that I have to pay NetX in order to uh, link the databases. But I think overall, considering how difficult it would be to access M plus. I think we ended up better than I thought, easier than I thought to get them linked up. And it is a one-way transfer. We talked a lot about that. We don't want people, they registrars don't want people entering things in the dams that don't get back to M plus. Right. Yeah, that's how we generally see it done. Um, hopefully that answered that. Um, as of now, that was the last question. Hopefully we answered yeah. all of those that came in. That's um, fantastic. So timely. Yeah, we are right on time, even a few minutes to spare. Um, I think we will leave it there then. Um, I mean, if thanks anyone a lot. wants to, if anyone yeah, wants to email me questions, if anyone thinks of questions later and they want to email me, you can. It's Claire underscore Blackman at PEM.org. PEM is a PBS at PBM. Okay. All right. I guess that's it, folks. Thanks a lot, Claire. Really appreciate it. And um, we'll speak to you guys soon. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate you coming out. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.